good afternoon everyone to this session on winning uh, public support to transforming uh, social care okay everyone uh, and i think i'll kick off uh, as you know uh, neil crowther will be set setting out uh, the evidence and it's clear or changing the way we talk about social care and we can shift the public's mindset about what social care can be and do and through doing uh, uh, so command greater support uh, for investment and reform but for that to happen we need to get this new story out there and to borrow a, a, fil a familiar idea from the uh, world we're living through at the moment it needs to become a dominant variant yet yeah, recent weeks suggest a high level of immunity to talking about social care this way with continued preference for placing a spotlight on current problems alone so what do we need to do to uh, get more people and organizations to adopt this narrative how can we best promote it and support people to draw on it do we need to think bigger than that about the campaign or build a movement in a moment Neil will take us through the new narrative, explaining the research behind it. Then there will be an opportunity to comment and ask questions. Uh, we'll then go in to hear from two people. One, Brian e. Shannon from Doncaster uh, Council. And two, Morgan Griffiths Davis from uh, Alzheimer's society about the different ways they have adopted the vision and what they hope it will help them to achieve. We will then break into groups and we'll uh, uh, like you to explore uh, these questions which we just put into the chat room and uh, which you might like to think about as you listen to our uh, speakers. One, how you might use the narrative in your own work and support uh, that would help you do so. Two, uh, how can we encourage others to adapt uh, the narrative in the way they communicate about social care? And the third question, what uh, what do you think social care futures and its partners need to do to reach uh, the public at large? Now, I'd like to introduce Neil Crowther, who will take us through the new narrative and, uh, and research behind it. Over to you, Neil. Okay. Hi, everyone. And thanks, Clinton, um, for, for sharing this session today. Um, and I'm actually going to begin with some thanks before I go into it, because I think this piece of work really speaks to the way social care future is and continues to be a genuine collaboration and the sum of its, its parts, because a whole lot of people, including many of you probably on this call, have been involved at different stages of, of developing this from the working group that we drew together from our movement, which included Wendy Mitchell, Philly Hare, Clenton, Jordan Smith, Wendy Lauder, Brian E on this call, Sean Lockwood, um, to working with Equally Hours, Catherine Quinton and Alice Jennings, who some of you will have met if you are, are gathering last, last February, um, to Eleanor and Carmen at Lancaster University, who helped us to understand how the media was talking about it to Chris Hatton, who worked with me on, on exploring how campaigners were currently talking about social care. Uh, but crucially to all of the people that are involved in our movement that spent time telling this story, writing this story, working out what was Social Care Future's vision? What do we want social care to look like and feel like? And it's been quite clear that that vision has proved really, really powerful in creating a different space, a different platform, a different set of ideas about where we want to, to be in the future. And you'll have heard it talked about uh, all day today. So um, I just want to begin by thanking everyone for contributing to this and for owning this. 
uh, and thanking you in advance because this is the key thing for getting out there and using and telling this story and making it as um as clinton just said if it's not a bit inappropriate the dominant variant this is the story that we want to see all out there kind of defying the future of, of social care um so i'm going to take you through um uh the research as clinton said and the narrative and then there'll be opportunity to ask some questions or make any points that you want to make but then we're going to break into groups and uh after we hear from brian Ian and uh, morgan break into groups and explore how we can work together more so let me just uh share my slides just bear with me a sec oops you don't want to see those ones again sorry these ones, right. Okay, so um, it's been interesting today because um, there's some really some bad and sad news, wasn't there? Because it's 10 years on from the Winterbourne View scandal being exposed in the press, and that's received quite a lot of coverage today. You've also heard this morning about the changes that um, the Social Care Future Inquiry want to bring about, and that's based on testimony from several hundred people about how social care is letting them down now. It's failing people and it's doing harm. And I know from my own personal experiences last year, trying to secure care and support for my dad and support for my mom, just how hard all of that is. And all that is undisputed. We have really deep problems and we need to solve them. So the point about what I'm about to share with you isn't to sweep those problems under the carpet, um, but it's the fact that if all we ever talk about are these problems, if all we ever do is point at them, eventually people's sense of urgency, their sense that something should be done, can turn into a sense that nothing can be done, a sense of despondency, a sense of fatalism. And that's especially the case given actually much of the public has no idea really what social care is, what it does or why it's valuable. Um, and I think crucially, as uh, Thomas Coombs, who's been a real inspiration, has said, if we don't make the case for the world that we want to see, who will? Nobody's going to make that case for us. So this narrative is about setting forward the future that we want um, and in a way that can inspire and build support amongst the, amongst the public at large, amongst politicians, amongst everyone that really uh, has a stake or that we can make feel that they have a stake in that future um okay so just quickly i'm not going to go into detail on this but there's a lot of research behind what we've done because what we've been doing is following a methodology and approach called framing or reframing um and so we've gone through a number of stages um uh defining the change that we want the work that we've done together you know what is the future what should social care do how should it work we've done that together We've looked at the landscape. So how is this talked about now? How do the public think about this now? We've thought, uh, this is what I'm going to come on to today, about what are the current mindsets? So when the public think about social care, what's immediately coming to mind? What are that, what's their sense of what it's about? Um, we've explored that. And most crucially, we've explored in depth, how do we persuade the public that our way of thinking about social care is the way to think about it and win their backing uh, for that change? Um, We've been working, and some of you have met, with the experts on this type of communications, Equally Hours, and a research company called Servation to help us go and talk to members of the public. We focused on, um, and I'm not going into detail, but what's sometimes called the conflicted or persuadable members of the public. That's to say there's a large section of the public that don't have really rigid views. They're not fixed on one political party or one way of thinking about the world. They kind of move dependent on the messages and the ideas they're presented with. And that's who we've been trying to work out. Who do we, how can we talk to them? Because they're a big section of the public and they have a lot of influence over uh, elections and politics and public opinion. We've carried out qualitative research. We've done focus groups and what's called a co-creation forum where we've talked with people at length uh, about their thinking, try to work out what their assumptions are about social care, uh, the type of messages that, that they support, that they reject. And we've been refining the message as we go along. And then at the end of that, we did um, a survey of over 3000 uh, adults uh, to test different forms of the message and to see which worked best. And I'll share some of the findings of that in a moment. And then most recently, I'm going to give you a bit of a preview of this. We did a survey of local councillors. So we've been asking local councillors how they feel about our vision and our way of talking about social care, whether they support that or not. So I'm going to share a bit of that too. 
So what was the challenge that we had when we mapped where the current story of social care was and what our story was? Uh, and you'll have heard a lot of this today in the various sessions from Anna, um, I'm sure in the Valuable and Vulnerable session or the session on commissioning. But our story is very much about fundamentally people having a good life. Mm -hmm. The current public story, though, tends to be about people just being kept alive. Mm -hmm. uh, our story is about social care as a vehicle. It helps you have that life. The current public story is often social care as a destination. So you'll hear ministers talk about people in social care as social care is somewhere you go to. Uh, not something that helps you live in the place you call home and live the life that you want to. Our story is about caring about and supporting one another. So it's about solidarity. It's about, you know, how, how we support each other in our community. The public story is still very much about looking after our most vulnerable citizens. We're about nurturing relationships and connections between people. The public story is still very much about social care as a single sector or industry that delivers a service to people. Our story is about people with gifts and potential and how, with the right support, that gifts and potential can be unlocked for the benefit of the wider community. The public story is about people with needs. We talk about the growing value of great care and support. The public story is about the growing cost of support. We talk about investing resources. The public story is about spending. We talk about everybody having a role to play. The public story only seems to think that government can, can answer any of this. And where our emphasis is on opportunity, the public story remains very much one of crisis. So those are the things that we wanted to change. So the challenge of the work we've been doing is how do we actually create a bridge? So how do we change the public story? How do we reach the public so that our story becomes the dominant story, the dominant way to think about social care? And what the research we've done has shown is that we can do it, but we have to obviously get that story to the public. And that's what we'll be talking about in a moment. So where is this, this vision? And you've all seen it, you'll have seen it countless times, but I just want to just spend a bit of time explaining it and thinking behind it and why it's important. So the first one is our, our headline vision uh, with which many of you will be uh, familiar. Um, we all want to live in the place we call home with the people and things that we love and communities where we look out for one another doing what matters to us. That's a vision that uh, about 80 of us got together in Manchester and created a couple of years ago. It's not changed. We put that through the research and everybody kind of bought it. And I think it's not surprising that a lot of other organizations have taken that and are now using it themselves. But just to, to make sense of it a little bit, it does a number of things. One, you'll notice there is no mention in that vision of social care, and there is no mention of older and disabled people either. What that vision is about is the kind of universal life that we would all wish to live, okay? But it does a number of things at the same time. It puts the accent on results. So we're not talking about the social care sector. We're talking about people, people living their lives well. That's the starting point. It uses values that, again, you won't normally hear when we talk about social care. As I already mentioned, a lot of the social care debate talks about looking after vulnerable people. So it's very paternalistic. This doesn't do that. The values here are about self-direction, us being in control of our own lives, doing the things that matter to us. They're about solidarity and communities where we look out for one another. But they're also about security and belonging living in the place we call home with the people and things that we love, being anchored in our own selves and in the world. And that's really, really important because when we forget to tell this story, people have no sense of what, the, what we're aiming at, what the North Star is, why social care might be valuable to them. And one of the things that this story does, and we, we've been able to show it through the research, is it helps make social care seem relevant to everyone rather than just for some people. So rather than them and us, which is often what, what, what people feel after hearing about social care, they think it's for other people over there. It creates a sense of a larger us. This is about and for everyone. So having done that, obviously it's important then to explain uh, what social care is, what its role is within that. So we point back at that vision and we say, if we are someone we care about has a disability or health condition during our life, we might need some support to do these things. That's the role of social care. So again, as people have said uh, various times today, we're defining the role of social care as supporting people to lead the life that they want to lead fundamentally. But people don't necessarily understand how that works or for that matter, how we would imagine that working. And again, here's where we introduce something that's quite different from how the story is generally told. And uh, you'll see there's a picture of a web on the screen there. What we actually did was test a number of different um, metaphors. And actually, those were metaphors that, um, again, members of this movement helped create and generate when we all met in Manchester last year. Some of them didn't work so well. Some of them worked 
uh, really, really well. We explored them through the focus groups and the other research, and these are the ones that, that perform well. But what we're saying here is that when organised well, social care helps to weave a web of relationships and support in our local communities that we can draw on to live our lives in the way that we want to, with meaning, with purpose and with connection, whatever our age or stage in life. And again, just to unpick this a little bit, this is doing a number of things. One, big emphasis on we can draw on to live our lives. Again, we're not talking about people accessing social care or being delivered social care. We're talking about people drawing on it so they can live the lives that they want to. And with this accent, that the, that the real test of whether social care is working is not whether it just keeps people alive, but it's whether it supports people to have meaning, purpose and connection in their life, whatever age they're at, whether we are a young person just making our first steps into adult life, or even if we're in the last few days of our life and we're, 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 in, we're in older mm -hmm. age. It's just as relevant. Okay, where are you? I'm in a conference. But... Uh, so if we could just turn on mute, if you're not talking. Um, the other thing that's really important in this is that it makes people that draw on social care the hero in their own stories. Again, this is about people leading their lives, being supported by social care. Much of the, the narrative you'll read in the press or, or even the way organisations in social care talk about themselves is about the social care sector. We've heard that over the last year about COVID. It's care homes have been badly affected. The social care sector is at the point of collapse. We rarely ever hear about people themselves that draw on social care. And people first just has to be our starting point here. Whenever we talk about it, this is about people and their lives and communities and families. That has to be in the forefront of our frame. The other thing we do is we don't talk about social care as the problem. We indicate that social care may not at the minute be organised well, but the point is that social care, when organised well, is the answer to these things. It's what's going to help us lead these lives. Again, a lot of the messaging from a lot of organisations is social care is broken, social care is in crisis. And what that does is lead people to think maybe it can't be fixed, maybe this is just too hard. So we want to change that as well. So this is about social care organised differently, offering us all the way we can lead our lives uh, to achieve the vision I set out at the beginning. So I said this was just one of the metaphors we used. We also talk about uh, social care helps nurture an ecosystem of relationships and support in our local communities. We talk about how when organised well, social care acts as the glue that binds together relationships and support in our local communities. And we also tested some others. Uh, when organised well, social care provides us with a vehicle that allows us to do what matters to us. And when organised well, social care provides us with the tools that allow us to do what matters to us, whatever our age or stage in life. As I said, each of those things does the same thing. Social care is positioned as the thing that helps us lead the lives that we want to lead. And all of those different metaphors and ways of talking about it works reasonably well. The final part, though, was about um, saying what needed to happen and who was responsible for change. We had to spend quite a bit of time on this. So we begin... We believe that this can and should be happening everywhere and for everyone. We found that the public liked our vision, but they felt it wasn't something that could be delivered overnight. And we had two choices. We could either pretend that it was, or we could accept that it isn't, and we don't believe it is. We've leaned into that. So we're saying the government must make good social care a priority and begin investing more in it. So we want to see it incrementally invest more resources over time. But as I said at the beginning, we don't think this is just about government and its funding. We think it's equally about the way social care is organised at the local level. So we want to see more local councils urgently working alongside and supporting local people and organisations to bring these ideas to life by organising and funding and resourcing social care differently. So that's, that's the narrative, um, which many of you will have seen. I just want to take you through what the results were quickly. Um, before people had seen the narrative, um, their default thinking was very much what we'd mapped before. So they saw social care as about looking after vulnerable people that couldn't look after themselves. But there were some things that we could build on. Um, there were some, you know, people felt it was important. Uh, they felt that it, it did have potential to help people to live their lives the way they wanted to. So it wasn't, we weren't starting from a really low, low base. And also we found that when we asked people about what constituted a good society, there were good things to build on as well. People talked about uh, communities where people belonged, where people uh, looked out for one another. So there were some good things that we could tap into. 
But what we actually found this narrative did was cause people to express the idea that social care was more important to themselves and those close to them, that it was a benefit both to those who need support and the wider community, that it was a greater priority for government above other areas of policy and actually second only to the, the NHS, that it was more worthy of investment by central government and that it was possible to reform social care in a better and more sustainable way now. So it gave cause for more optimism, more of a sense that actually we could make this change and we could do so successfully. So those are really good results. But the key thing for us, of course, is that it changed the mindsets as well. So after seeing this, despite showing more support, people were significantly less likely to associate social care with paternalistic ideas such as vulnerability are far more likely to associate with words such as independence, community and relationships. And more people also agreed that social care is about people having the support to live how, where and with whom they choose. Social care draws together relationships and support and living how we choose to live is dependent on the strength of the relationships that we have. So in answer, effectively, the research showed that this message changes how people think, but in, in changing how they think, it also causes them to give more support for change. So it could be a powerful way to build support over time for a very different social care future. And I said I'd just share something else. We've not published this yet, we've only just got the findings. Um, but we also, as part of the research, have done a survey of local councillors. I've got results from just under 700 councillors across uh, England. We'll, we'll share the results in full soon. But I thought this was worth sharing. We found that 94% of councillors agree with our headline vision, we all wanna live in the place we call home. And 92% agree with what we say social care should do and how it should work. So this idea that when organized well, it weaves a web of relationships and support in our local communities. And that just struck me as a really good sign uh, that we're onto something and that we are beginning to help shift thinking and define a different future. And we know a number of organizations have already adopted the vision are adapting it or using it but we clearly need to see more of that and that's what we're, um, we're going to move on and hear about uh, in a moment but thank you back to you clinton thank you very much uh, uh neil um is, we'll use this time for questions and uh answers uh if anyone wants to put anything in the chat from what they've heard from neil pre uh, presented we'll uh, have a quick conversation. Oh, you can raise your hand. Yeah, this, this one in the chat saying, who are the six and 8%? <laughs> the owner, are you there? Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I know you won't name and shame, but it'd be interesting to know the reasons. I mean, I get that's a really good stat, but it'd be interesting to know the reasons behind that. Whether it's just that they didn't like the like terminology, or actually, is is that the fundamental? You know, get those guys, and then everybody signed up. And what power are those people wield? Yeah, um, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. I've only seen the headlines. I've got um, a load of tables that break it down and tell me who's who's what. Because we looked at it by political affiliation, different types of council, different roles, and things like that. So there's and gender and various other things. So there's a lot more detail there too. Uh, to look at it, it could have just been that people didn't like the words and didn't yeah, like the, the I mean, provision yeah. we don't know uh, we might not know from this but um i'm sort of thinking that actually 94 percent is a lot higher than i i thought i've actually been quite worried about the results of this poll to be honest especially given the obviously the challenges that many councils are finding themselves in so it, it gave me ground for optimism i think overall definitely i was also being a hey, we've got three <laughs> we've got three hands up we uh i think it's the councillor from stockport then we've got um uh Ashling and duncan okay. from dementia so over to you councillor i'm from stockton not stockport <laughs> i like stockport but stockton's better <laughs> yeah no it, I, i'm very interested in in your findings and as i said earlier um, you know, one of the things that we were talking about in our festival of learning was, you know, where where was the outrage following the Queen's speech? And you know, as the lead member, I do get uh, quite a lot of emails from members of the public asking questions about usually their own 
personal care or, or, or their um, uh, family member or someone they care for. I have had nobody can contact me and say, what are you doing about the future of social care? Even though I've made made uh, comments in the press or through through um, my my blog, not my blog, I don't have a blog, um, but um, any any articles that I write, I you know I do get quite political sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. I, I I tell you what really worries me is that because I used to be the the lead member for children. Do are we or do we have to wait? Till there's some real sort of catastrophe similar to Victoria Climbier or something like that that actually rouses people to say what the hell are you going to do about social care and I was really interested um, in the previous session where was it Stephen uh, highlighted the, the, the word brave because I'd written it on my notes because I think um, we do have to be brave, but as members and as councils, we've got to be prepared to defend what we do if we do risky things. And, and you know, there is a great phrase that I took from, and, and I think I'll give him credit again. I think it was Martin who actually said it, he'll correct me. Um, do we manage risk or do we suppress opportunity? That really has stuck with me, and I've taken that in as the, the lead governor in the Mental Health Trust. And I think we've got to be brave enough to be able to say to the public, we are taking risks. Sometimes something might go wrong and we'll get some bad publicity because the media doesn't understand risk. And I, I just think, you know, as councillors, we do, we do have to be brave. Uh, and I'm prepared. I'm, I am prepared to be um, brave, but not all members are, you know, if you've got elections coming up, there's, you know, I've, I've got to get those people to vote for me. And, yeah. you know, so I'm sorry if I'm ranting on a bit, but it's something I feel really quite passionate about. Clinton, so I, just in the interest of time, I'll respond once we've heard from uh, Ashling and um, Duncan, wasn't it, I think? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Clinton, um, and thank you, Neil. Uh, that was really great and actually quite optimistic and quite <laughs> encouraging in lots of ways. And, you know, there's something I think so important about how we have that conversation with the public, you know, and who do we mean in our own place and areas by the public? You know, there, there's so much potential is it circles of influence or, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, we've got, if we think about all the people as part of our movement and then, you know, our friends and family and how we can use them to actually have the kind of conversation that we need to be having. And I think we need to be, I know the word's been used so much today, but that bravery about also being a bit more willing to talk about social care in the language of this movement um, yeah. and unless in a way that we think I think sometimes we end up using language we think the public will understand and that ends up with us using language like social care like vulnerable like because we think oh well they'll get they'll get that if we talk about mm -hmm. um, people in that way and yet then actually we have to give credit I think that actually if you do reframe some of that narrative as your evidence is shown a significant proportion of the public are able to engage on that. And yeah. I think there's an honesty and a frankness that we're all duty bound, everyone who's in this call and beyond to, I think, play a greater role in owning. Because I suppose I'm very conscious, Neil, and I'm sure lots of us in the call are saying, well, yeah, I've been part of movements and organisations and that have never used the language of vulnerable, have always kind of positioned what we do as being about person-centered about working alongside people and and yet we haven't made the difference that yeah. we would want to make and I do worry that the last year some of us who didn't use that language have actually even drifted into using it because of the the noise around the pandemic pandemic and yeah. the need to focus well and stuff so I, I, I suppose what I'm saying is I think there's more to be optimistic than pessimistic in what you said. And there's something about how we 
use some of this and own some of this in our local areas to try and begin to have more of those conversations and maybe we need to think about what are the the tools the resources that we through the movement can make available in different formats and in simple ways so we can help people to have those conversations because we have to get political at the end of the day we will have to demand something different from either the local councillors or national government yeah thank you uh, thank, thank you for that, Arlene. Duncan, and then uh, I'll back to you, uh, Neil, then we'll have to carry on, cut it, uh, I'll have to cut it short. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, just picking up really some of the points that Ailing was making there. Um, language is absolutely pivotal here, uh, in my opinion. Um, we've developed a form of language that uh, clearly is really welcomed by uh, by councillors, by politicians, it's an open door. It's it's a it's a fabulous vision, um, but I don't think that uh, with us speaking this visionary language and the treasury speaking a much more financially driven language, that we will find it easy to have a conversation at present. Um, I had the dubious pleasure of reading uh, reports, National Audit Office. Um, King's Fund, OBR, and the language that they use is all about financial responsibility, outcomes to describe social care. Um, I think we need to find a way to bridge from our vision into a much more um, treasury oriented language in order to be able to develop those conversations. Um, it's great if the general public gets behind our vision. But I think the bottom line is it's a much smaller number of much more influential people that we need to be targeting. And if we could get our vision into some of those NAO reports, uh, the OBR, um, we would be doing a tremendous job. Okay. Thank you, Duncan. Neil? Uh, yeah, I'll just run, I'll give very quick, quick replies. Um, uh, just one thing to say that this, 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 what we've published isn't a script, it's a framework. So, uh, and we've published other guidance on our website about some rules to follow, things just to kind of try and do. But you can use that framework when you're telling the story of an individual's journey. And you know, I think Megan Flower's story that Shared Lives produced is brilliant. And it follows all of these kind of steps of this journey. She's the protagonist in her own story. It talks about how through relationships, her life has been transformed. It really kind of sells the values underlying this idea. So it's not about just saying the same thing over and over and again, although the vision is helpful. It's about how you use this as a framework to think about any story that you, you might, be, might be telling. And into that, you can map the issue that Duncan's just raised to think about, about finance, and that may be something we need to do. My, my main response, Duncan, will be, you might see all of that, but it's not made the blindest bit of difference. And if we compare actually how uh, some people have campaigned on things like social security and poverty to say the achievements, and, and it's partly superstardom, but I don't just think it's that, but the achievements of Marcus Rashford, who has been using very powerfully framing and storytelling and has changed the politics. My analysis is that the treasury are not, not acting on social care because they think it's too expensive. They're not, not acting on it because it's not yet become expensive enough to ignore. Uh, to not ignore, rather. And so I think we have to change the politics. So I think it's, it's both those things. And then I think in terms of where's the outrage, I, I agree. I mean, one of the things we're looking at is how to build a movement for change. Hopefully that will be a movement centred on hope and optimism about the future rather than just kind of anger. But there was some really interesting work done in the States behind the Caring Across Generations campaign. And what they found that often in social movements are driven by a sense of anger but actually what a lot of people, when they're at the moment of drawing on social care for themselves or the relatives are feeling is either no energy to do anything else or guilt. The emotions are not generally the ones that drive people towards becoming part of a movement and a campaign. So we have to think very carefully about the emotions in play and, and how, we would, how we would do that. But I do think that's a big problem so I think that we want to address. But we, we better move on, Quentin. Okay, thank you. Sorry, everyone. We'll uh, have to try and see how we can pick up other uh, questions, but I have to carry on. I've got two more speakers. But um, picking up on using the narrative in our work and making sure it reaches the public, we, uh, we know that a number of 
in, influential people and organisations that are used and shared the new narrative, including the Shadow Minister for uh, Social Care, Liz Kendall, the Local Government Association, and the Association of the, uh, Directors of Adult uh, Social Services, for example. But how can we encourage a wider adoption and using of it so that it reaches the public we need to reach? This is where you play a part. We are now are going to hear from two uh, uh, people who are using the narrative in their own work. Now I'd like to introduce Bryony Shannon, uh, Dunk, uh, Doncaster Council, and Bryony sat on the advisory group for social care futures research and writes a lot of her own blogs about the power of language in social care. Over to you, uh, Bryony, please. Hi everyone, um, thanks Jason and thanks Neil too. So yeah, I'm Bryony Shannon, I work at Doncaster Council as a strategic lead for practice development in our adult health and wellbeing directorate. And I just want to talk to you briefly about how we're using, starting to use the social care future vision in Doncaster. So obviously Doncaster, like everywhere, has seen huge amounts of change in the last couple of years, as well as COVID, and um, we've experienced significant flooding towards the end of 2019. So people in the borough and organisations have been in real crisis response mode for over 18 months. Um, this obviously has had a huge impact on the people living and working in Doncaster. We've also seen some really brilliant examples of people coming together um, within the organisations and within communities about caring about and supporting each other. And there's a real sense of pride in what we can achieve when we work together. So we're conscious, we know there's already lots of great work going on in Doncaster. And as we start to look ahead to a hopefully brighter future, we felt it was a really good opportunity to reflect on what's working well already, but think about also what needs to change and what really matters. And I think we've all obviously been reflecting on that sort of in the space of the pandemic and what's important to us all. So we wanted to take a bit of a step back, back from the thinking about what we do and think more about why we do what we do. And to us, it felt like the social care future vision was a perfect way to describe the why we do what we do. So in Doncaster, we're adopting and slightly adapting the social care future vision to form our own vision for Adults Health and Wellbeing Directorate. So that vision, and it'll sound familiar, but we're saying we want every person in Doncaster to live in the place they call home with the people and things that they love and communities where they look out for one another doing things that matter to them. And we've also developed a statement of purpose based on the, on the vision to describe what we do. So this reads, we support people in Doncaster to live in the place they call home with the people and things that they love and communities where they look out for one another doing things that matter to them. So we've deliberately referred to people in Doncaster in the statements to acknowledge that we serve everyone in the borough and it is about everybody to move away from that the frequently used, the othering labels that we've been talking about, like vulnerable people, our most vulnerable and those with care and support needs. And we've also chosen to use the term support to describe our role in working alongside people in Doncaster and supporting people to live the life they want to lead. So shifting away from that more familiar narrative around caring for or looking after or protecting people. So we think adopting this vision um, in Doncaster has lots of purposes. I think it gives us a strong identity as a directorate, which is really rooted in good lives, well lived. And um, sets out to Doncaster people and partner organisations and our own staff about what, what they can expect from us and what our values are. And we think it can help bring us all closer together after this period of huge change with a real shared sense of direction for the future. It also shifts us from describing what we do in terms of tasks and processes and transactions. So we spend a lot of time talking about assessments and reviews and referrals and safeguarding. We want to put the focus firmly back on people and communities and on conversations and connections and relationships and good lives. Well, we think we can use the vision to frame our individual conversations with people. So shifting from assessments to services, to talking with people about the lives we want to lead, so what home looks and feels like, relationships and connections people want to experience or to build and maintain, um, communities people are already part of or want to be part of, 
what people want to start doing, keep doing, and what really matters to people in order to, for them to live their lives in the way that they want to. And also, I think I was in the commissioning session earlier, and it, this, the vision and the associated narrative does really challenge us to think differently about the support that we organise and fund, and to work much more closely with Doncaster people to co-produce and co-commission alternatives. So it's really early days, um, but we are already using the vision in a number of ways. So, for example, we're currently working with the Social Care Future for Excellence, um, in, sorry, Social Care Institute for Excellence, and um, with people in Doncaster who draw on support already to look at improving access to care and support in Doncaster. And we're keeping the vision at the core of our thinking about new ways of working. Uh, we've just introduced a network of practice champions across all our teams. And um, we started the first meeting with a real focus on the vision as an overarching framework for developing our practice going forward. And we've also referenced the vision in a recent recruitment campaign for a new principal social worker. And uh, there is still time to apply if anyone's interested in that position. Um, so we're using the vision um, to anchor all proposals for improvements, really, and um, to make sure that they explicitly increase our ability to achieve that vision. So we know we've got some great foundations to build on, but we really do know that we need to continue to learn and to improve. We're clear that the vision is why we do what we do, but we also need to think about how we do what we do. So as Martin mentioned earlier, we're talking to um, we're talking with Think Local like Personnel, TLAP, about using making it real to help us work alongside people in Doncaster with the experience of drawing on social care to support to make the vision a reality. And we're also working with directors of adult social care across South Yorkshire, so in Doncaster, Sheffield, Barnsley and Rotherham, to adopt the social care future vision as more of a shared narrative for social care across the region. We're really looking forward to Neil joining us for a, couple, for a session in a couple of weeks' time to talk more about this. So we know there's lots to do, but we're really excited about adopting and embedding the vision and achieving a um, better, better future, better future for everybody in Doncaster. Thank you. Thank you, Brownie, for sharing uh, what you're doing in Doncaster. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Morgan Griffiths David, who leads on policy on personalised care at the Alzheimer's uh, Society. Over to you, Morgan. Hi there, everyone. Um, lovely to talk to you today. I've just tried sharing my screen. I hope you can all see it. Shout out to yep. Charles. I'm Policy Manager of Care, as uh, Clinton says, at Alzheimer's Society, and we are the leading dementia charity in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We campaign to create change for and with people affected by dementia. I just want to talk to you for a few minutes today. Traditionally, our flagship fixed dementia care campaign has looked at social care reform as having three main pillars, cost, quality and access. And obviously, they're all intertwined. For example, if we manage to make care free, but it's still of poor quality, have we really fixed anything? But because of the prospective social care green paper that the government has talked about for years now, um, over the last few years, we've really focused in on the the issues of catastrophic costs that some people, particularly those affected by dementia, can face. Um, however, in particular with the pandemic showing up the issues with quality that we all know well in greater relief, there's an opportunity now where we wanted to shift to talk more about the quality of care that uh, exists out there and what people need to see in, in the system. And with this growing momentum for reform, very welcome from social care futures in particular, uh, the time is really now to, to start to build on that. So I just wanted to share some of the findings of a recent report we did. So we started a research project late last year where we wanted to map some of the research evidence, including from our centres of excellence, universities we work with, and what they were telling us mattered in, in terms of improving people's lives in social care. Um, what we knew from our engagement with people affected by dementia over the last few years, and what the legislation told us and the various frameworks that underpin it. And to be honest, none of this is going to surprise anyone here. It centered on what we already knew, personalized, person-centered care is what's key. Um, while a lot of the time providers in particular look at personal care and the importance of the day-to-day, the -day, that alone is not necessarily going to give people a good quality of life. We need to move from a state where everyone is looking at time and task and instead 
focuses on giving people the rights and the ability to access truly personalized care that meets their needs, puts them in control, recognizes their own agency and their relationships as core and fundamental when drawing on support from providers and from, from society as a whole. So this is some of how we, we frame that. Um, this is what we produced. Um, our most recent paper, uh, Future for Personalized Care, innovative title, I know, um, which had the social care future narrative at its heart and heavily impacting the way we presented concepts. Um, for example, what do you skip the slide there? The narrative we found really helped us provide, a really helped provide us with a clearer structure on how to frame the importance of community and living in a place we call home. That's something we know people with expert dementia want and need to see, and this gave us a really positive way of looking at it. We are also in the initial stages of this. We are gradually moving some of our policy language to incorporate more of the narratives, phrasing and framing and building it into new reports. It gives us a good guide, and we found in particular it's been helpful in flipping some of the existing structures of the writing work looking at that shared perspective and putting the values and vision at the forefront rather than leading with the challenges and the uh, need for the government to take action or for any of us to take action um, and helps frame the positive vision of a web of relationships which is language we particularly appreciate. Just starting the conversation as far as we're really concerned in the coming months, we're going to be doing more engagement work with people affected by dementia. We just completed some new user involvement research with a thousand person survey that uh, I'm just analyzing when I have free time, um, which we hope will guide our work in further themes uh, in the future within social care uh, policy development. And we're hoping to build this into the narrative as we go, where eventually all of our policy positions across health and social care will have this drive for personalization as a core part of it as opposed to just an add-on as it has perhaps been in the past. And we can use the, this narrative to help make a more persuasive case for change. And I'm really excited for the opportunity to do so. Um, those are just a few thoughts. I'll drop a couple of links in the chat to our recent paper and would love people's thoughts on, on how we develop that as, as the discussion progresses. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Morgan. Um, because we were running out of time, I'd like to pose uh, some three questions to our uh, audit audience. And the, three, the first question to think about, to try and get some discussion with the, the limited time we've got, how you might use the narrative in your own work and the support that would help you to do so. So if we just, pose that question first and just uh, any hands or um you know put anything in the chat i think donna you've got your hand and vicky hi hang on i just need to sit myself up um yeah it was kind of like something that was said a little bit earlier that i was kind of getting a bit like i said it before the only way that we're going to go forward with this is if we all start working together as like one, like, yeah, we're going to be scared. Yeah, we've got to take risks. But at the end of the day, you're going to make mistakes. You, you know, you're going to mess up. You're going to, you know, you're going to get it wrong. You're only human, but by getting it wrong, you're going to get it right. Do you know what I mean? But it seems at the moment there's a lot of this language like jargon that they all speak and they all do in their corner and we're all doing in our, oh, we speak another language to what they speak. So we don't understand what they're saying. And it, that's where I think the communication has to be a lot better than what it is. Um, how we go about that, I have no idea. Um, it's just hard. Like, you just have to kind of, if we start all working together instead of working as two separates, I think that's the way forward. Thank you, Donna. Um, Vicky? Clinton. Um, yeah, in terms of the question, um, um, how am I looking at it from the perspective of someone 
one who has helped set up a user-led organization and and i.e together all are able for, um, which is in turn created my own support network uh, for not only myself but a few of us as well who either are not eligible for services or choose not to use services for varying different reasons um, uh, like I said in the previous group um, uh, this um, is the sort of thing that myself and the other guys at Together All Are Able help prom helping promote um, because um, um, social care it's not always about uh, just services and that uh, it's about can sometimes be about ima being imaginative and um, see hey, what ideas people have got because there might be loads of people with ideas for businesses out there who I mean something simple like walking the dog or um, going into someone's house and doing their ironing once a week mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't have to be complicated and it can be very simple but if it helps the person and, and their mental and physical health well Oh, you save it's saving money. Hey, the person's living a fulfilling life. It's a win win, and overall, so just something to think about. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Vicky. Uh, uh, we've got another hand up. Uh, I think it's Fee. Hi, uh, yeah, um, just a quick one to the um, the suggestion about how you might uh, use the narrative in your own work and support. I think. Obviously, you, you did lots of focus groups and workshops. So, um, sort of some of the slide, the even slide decks, and some of the setup of that would be quite helpful. If that's not available already, um, apologies. I've only just come back off mat leave, so I haven't dug down deeply into it just yet. But um, so that that kind of thing would be helpful, not to completely duplicate it, but to take a sort of pro, you know, a, 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 the framework or the toolkit, and then apply it to wherever you're working. Because actually. I jest, but I, I, as my mom said something the other day, and I was like, have I not taught you anything? So I want to use it with my own family. Um, and so, you know, like, and how can we make that accessible? And the other thing, I know it seems really, I don't mean it to sound so flippant, but actually, a, 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 you know, a jargon, a jargon button where if anybody's using jargon, if you ask people enough times to go, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? They, they stop they stop using it and they go, actually, I just mean this. So there's something about that that we all have to challenge ourselves and others with it, with, in, in the, the opportunities that we've got. And sometimes yeah. it is easier. It's not, it's not always a power thing. It's just easier. This is the language we use, but we all have to check ourselves and make sure that we have it as well. Yeah. So there's a couple of things off the top of my head. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything in the question in the chat room, um, Julie? There's lots in there, but it'd be quite hard yeah. to, to... Yeah, to, there to... is. I mean, I've just I've just been saving it, actually, so that um, Neil can keep it afterwards. Right. Uh, but, yeah. Can I, I mean, I just to, to Vicky's point, I think that's spot on. I think when we talk about weaving a web of relationships and support, I mean, we, we, we've sometimes wondered whether calling ourselves social care futures is a bit of an albatross, because actually the ideas that we're promoting are broader than how people tend to think about social care. The issue is we're trying to change social care itself as well aren't we but i was in a, a meet, meeting the other day with a, a woman speaking who set up an organization called little village to support uh, young mothers in in south london and the way she was talking about her ideas were more or less exactly the way we're talking about these ideas and i think maybe there's a different family of a different group of things we need to start talking about but absolutely you know um there's a woman i know from spain who was telling me about her um her, when her grandfather had alzheimer's and he, he refused to accept any other help into his, into his home, apart from their cleaner, uh, which meant that his wife could never go out and, and never be anywhere. So what she, what she did was invite all of her neighbours to send their ironing round so that the cleaner had a job and stay in the house and iron all day and keep her husband company and she was able to kind of go out. And it's that kind of creative resourcefulness thinking that, that is part of this, isn't it? Um, and yeah, uh, Fiona, we, 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 we can make the... Um, we can make the kind of background research and the, the upshot of the focus groups and everything else uh, available and the methodology if you're interested in, in seeing all of that. I don't think we want to sort of become um, kind of language police per se, but I, I would say just one rule for everybody to try and follow. 
If you know anyone, anyone in your life that isn't connected to social care who uses the words personalised care or independent living, tell me about them, because in my view, they don't exist. Just use human everyday language to describe what you're talking about and just get this, this stuff out of yourself. If we want to address everybody, if we want to create a sense that this is about all of us, we have to stop using this technocratic language that nobody else in their lives ever uses. And, and that's what we've tried to do a bit in this, um, in the vision, or certainly in the headline of it. Uh, uh, Sean, you've got your hand up. We need to support the learning disabilities, how we, how we look at in different or organisations to have we need as we need to speak up on behalf of the Manchester area and so forth. Uh -huh. We need to support people in different needs of like of, of wellbeing and mental health issues and important 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 to us. Yeah. And, and we need to look at what is really important to think up and we need to tell that to the England to focus on something. Every of nine Asians, you need to think about what is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think one of the things the inquiry has tried to do this morning when it launched is to say these are the things that matter to people in their everyday lives. But, you know, often the debate doesn't focus on those things, does it? Um, and, and just to say, one of the things that um, I've had some chats with Learning Disability England about, we have an easy read version of the guide, but I want to do some work with self-advocates, specifically self-advocates with learning disabilities about how to use this this work to kind of win change in your local area and how you talk about those those problems and the challenges. But I've had of learning disability England anyway. Yeah. I'm involved in social movement group yeah. needs to help people with advocacy to help each other yeah. out and control. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Neil and everyone, uh, just uh, like to leave you with these uh, thoughts that I'm uh, getting. Just to remember, hope is a discipline. You know, um, people talk about hope, but hope is a discipline. So, what we need to remember, we we need each other. So, we need to think about what part do we all play in this. If we want this new uh, world, the society that no one is uh, left behind, what do we, what's our part in doing that? And I'd just like to say thank you for all um, coming to the launch and listening all through the, uh, the sessions that we put on for Social Care Futures. Thank you all and speak soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.